Hey, welcome back everybody. I am Richard Terrell, I go by Kirby Kid, and this video series is called Design Over Time. It's a video series in which we talk about any kind of game design or design related topic that comes about my everyday life. And today, just like I promised on the last episode that I did uh, Rhythm Heaven, I said I wanted to do a deep dive, a deep thorough analysis of the level design of Rhythm Heaven. So even if you're not interested in music rhythm games, even if you're not really interested in Rhythm Heaven, uh, this analysis will set the foundation for understanding uh, a really fundamental aspect of action gameplay, whether that's a, a combat game like um, Zelda, whether that's a fighting game like Smash Brothers, or just about any game that's played in real time. So we're gonna get down to a really fundamental level and do a really quick overview of how I broke down my analysis. But first, we're gonna take a look at a little clip from Rhythm Heaven just to get you uh, understanding where I'm coming from and what we're talking about here. So this is the Japanese version. It basically says Remix. And we're gonna look at a little bit of what Rhythm Heaven has to offer in terms of its timing-based challenges. So every time you saw the stars uh, going off on the side of the screen there, that's when the player is inputting something in order to play this particular rhythm action game. So, you know, I love this game. It's my favorite rhythm action game series uh, of all time. There's four games in the series, and this particular game called Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix contains all the games in the entire series, or just about every mini game. So it's like the biggest, uh, most comprehensive collection of this style of uh, rhythm action game. So that's why I thought it'd be perfect to do this analysis. It's been about six to eight hours uh, compiling this chart and it's pretty complicated. As you can see, it goes all the way down. It does about uh, 86 of the game's challenges. And that's basically, uh, the game has 86 challenges in its main mode. So I went ahead and used that video that we just saw. Shout outs to, um, what is it, ZMX you know, for making a great video and putting a lot of time into uh, getting a perfect on every single game. That made my analysis a whole lot easier. So uh, as you can see, all the games are on the left and I had to figure out a way to systematically break down what these levels are made of. So I just wanted to go over my particular criteria and what's happening in this, in this chart with you. I'm gonna go ahead and make this bigger so you can see it. So let me just explain real quick how I assembled this chart and how I broke down the level design of this particular game. So on the left column we have name, pretty self-explanatory. Every game, uh, every mini game in the entire game has a specific name, so that's easy. Uh, easy tempo markings right here. Beat, beats per minute, it's the same tempo, uh, it's, it's the same system that we use for all music. So 60 is one beat per second, so 120 would be two beats per second. And as you can see, a lot of the games in Rhythm Heaven are hovering around 130. So that's the average right here, 130 beats. So it keeps it in a nice sort of brisk pace. Static rhythm. So these right here, let me just highlight these and change the color so you can see it. Let's make it a slightly darker blue. So these darker blue colors right here are a way of breaking down any timing challenge or any timing activity that you might encounter in life period, right? So when I originally designed the D-Cart system, which I'll show you right here, uh, the D-Cart system is a way of breaking down skill-based activity on any medium or any activity or any hobby. So it really gives us a nice way to compare things like video games versus playing a musical instrument or whatever else. And uh, these are the six or five or so ways that you can break down timing challenges. And let me just show you uh, what that looks like on the wheel here. So yeah, you have your, your 
difficulty design, which can be broken down into skill. And then there's five sub facets of skill, D cart, uh, dexterity for the D, K for the knowledge, A for the adaptation, R for the reflex, and T for timing. Uh, it's a little out of order here, but that's fine. Uh, and when we're talking about timing skills, we're really talking about static timing, which is the ability to time actions based on a simple unchanging time period like clapping or tapping to the beat. Obviously for a rhythm action game, there's gonna be a lot of steady beats in order to keep track of. So this is a um, kind of a must have to have in a breakdown. Then we have, let's see, I'm gonna contrast yeah, that with complex timing, okay. So complex timing is the opposite of static timing. This is the ability to subdivide, syncopate, or execute elaborate irregular layered timing. So just about anything more complex than clapping to a steady beat, it qualifies for a complex timing, whether it's a triplet or um, 16th notes almost, right? Whether it's a swung rhythms or, or jazz or anything like that, or just like unpredictable varied rhythms, right? Then we have external timing. It's having a sense of external timing involves using visual, auditory, or touch sensory inputs to time one's responses. This mostly involves extrapolating the timing of moving visual elements. So if you can see something about to hit something and you need to time it right when they collide, that is using your sense of external timing. Uh, it's a very different and distinct experience from using internal timing, which is a timing sense that is sustained without external stimuli, uh, keeping a steady beat in one's head, for example, keeping the timing uh, track in your head so that you just hit the beat right on the mark and there's nothing on the screen or nothing necessarily in your ears to cue you in on when that is. You just kind of have to remember and go with it. So obviously various musical challenges in the game will stress internal versus external timing. Um, acceleration and deceleration, just the ability to do static or complex timings when there's a tempo change, whether that's a, whether that's a sudden tempo change or a gradual one, doesn't really matter. Um, then we have tracks, which I didn't really put in the chart, but we're just going to chalk this one up to complex timing and kind of move on with that. So uh, let me just show you real quick also. So as you can see, these dark blue boxes in the chart, um, they represent the D card scales. And we have our static rhythm here, which I have articulated into the chart based on um, when on the beat that the player is required to do an input. So if it says two right here, um, it basically means you know, they give you beat one, you hit on beat two. So yeah, right here with Philbots, it's one through four. So you hit it on beats one and you hold through beats four and you release, or you hit it on beat one, you hold through beat eight and you release. Um, let me just show you a little bit of what that looks like. So let's go to two minutes and 30 seconds. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, release. And that's basically how that goes. So static rhythms, you know, it's gonna be that one through four, one uh, through eight timing for the entire mini game. And every time you just kind of react to the opportunities to start that, but it's pretty much the same thing. Um, so I marked on all these various games, you know, when you hit the beat, when you release, and then I just tallied how many distinct static rhythm timings there are. So with the case with Philbots, there are two different types of timing. You'll see here there's going to be a fat robot coming up. like that so uh, because that game has two different types of robots that you fill up there's going to be two different types of static timing challenges here and that's why I've tallied them up here as you can see the darker the color in this column right here the darker the color um, that means the more diverse timing challenges there are so you can kind of get a quick sense of how complex that is for each mini game for complex rhythms I didn't bother writing them out in any kind of um, pseudo musical notation. I just kind of noted here what kind of complex rhythms there are in the game. Uh, so this column is kind of hit or miss. I just wrote a little note of what's in there, but as you can see, it's dark uh, red color. So
That's a static chiming challenge. So it's not just that all the, the timing challenges, the patterns here are different from each other, it's that they're subdividing the beats, they're also adding holds in certain places, it makes a sort of a highly varied landscape of holds, rests, beats, and, and even a fast beat. So that's just a really clear example of why this onion challenge, this uh, rhythm tweezers is so complex. You know, approximately 32%, as you can see up here, of the challenges in the entire game have complex challenges, uh, while it's much more common for a challenge to have the static, chime, uh, static timing challenges. Acceleration and deceleration, just like I said, some of these games actually do speed up uh, halfway through or even multiple times throughout the whole thing, so approximately 11% of the ta challenges in the entire game use some kind of acceleration or deceleration tempo change. Uh, ex external timing. So being a video game, visual feedback is a big deal, uh, or audio feedback, but for the most part, video feedback. And we can see that 61% of all the challenges in the game use external visual feedback. Uh, that means it's just relying on what video games already do very well. Let me give you a really good example of an external timing challenge. Let's go with doo -doo 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 -doo. Rhythm Rally. So that's a really good one. As you might expect with a ping pong style game, you're going to be looking at the ball to determine what your beat is. So right there, if the ball bounces high, you know to uh, do it on a different timing than if it bounces low. And sure, you can hear when the ball bounces off the table, so that's kind of like uh, a little bit of audio feedback. For the most part, determining which is which is a matter of looking at the ball first and then letting that cue you in primarily. So that's a really good example of using external timers in this game to judge how you're going to play. So you can see down here, you don't want all of the challenges in the game to be visually feedback oriented, uh, but relying on some audio tells, relying on some video tells, and obviously a mix of both, like some of these challenges right here have a mix of both ex external and internal timing challenges based on the feedback. So you can see here, some do, some don't, some have it just an internal, some have it just an external. So it's quite a mix all the way down. And here's a good example of internal timers. I want to do um, one of my favorites. So for this challenge, you're gonna have to listen first, keep the beat straight in your head, and then play it back. And this is why it's an internal timing challenge. There are some challenges where you are playing on beat and sometimes they're going to say, hey, you're on beat. Why don't we switch to the off beat? I want to show you a game that mixes the on and off beats um, just like perfectly, right? The entire purpose of this static timing challenge is to get you used to what it feels like to mix between on and off beats. And even though it's the same uh, timing between when you press for the most part, switching back and forth can be quite the challenge. So let me show you one of my favorites, Lockstep. You can see the, the stars on the side for the beats. So 
cook. That one's great. So yeah, each one of these things that I'm going over, it's a very distinct kind of timing challenge. It creates a very distinct kind of feeling. It creates a uh, very distinct gameplay. And this is why I'm creating each of these as uh, its own axis on this breakdown so that we can know, um, you know, how varied the challenges are and how the, the game progresses and keeps the variation going. So as you can see here, the next column is column response. I kind of showed you that with the alien mini game, but when they give you a specific rhythm and you have to remember it and then respond back to it, that's a perfect example of uh, column response. There are some timing challenges that are external and don't use column response. And there's some that are column response that use more of external timing, but you know, we'll, we'll see a little bit of that later. So beyond that, you have to control the game and that's why we have columns for if you tap as your input, if you have any kind of hold, or if you have any extra buttons beyond that. Sometimes the games use the D-pad. Uh, other games in the past have used L and R buttons, but we're just going to chalk all of that up to extra buttons. And then a column here for whether or not the game obscures your visual feedback. So external timings are great, but sometimes the game plays around with the fact that if it gives you an external timer with some external uh, visual feedback and then it wants to test your internal timing, it may take away that feedback and say, like, do you actually know what the beat is? And there is a specific column here for that. Uh, let me show you a really good example of that where a game where it really messes with your sense of visual feedback and external timers. Let me see. So right there, if you were used to using the badminton as your sense of external timing and you're really, even if you're not relying on it 100%, right? Uh, the fact that when your partner pulls into the distance and it makes that badminton fly at you at top speed because you know the, the badminton still has to maintain the same beat so it has to travel faster to get back to you. Uh, if you were relying on external timing and this external feedback right here, it really would mess you up and I think that's hilarious. Because all you really need for this one is a a sense of internal timing and it's a static timing challenge anyway. You listen for the ba 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 bops, you know, to wait a beat, otherwise you just steadily hit it. So this is a really cool example of how the game will play with even some of the feedback that it gives you in order to create new texture, new kinds of challenges and new kinds of experiences. So this column right here, I just tally up all of the green Y's from this area and that just gives a simple number to evaluate how complex a particular game is. I count the number of visual cues for the game and audio cues and I also count the distinct actions you do. So sometimes the rhythms in the game vary, but you're still doing the same kind of input in order to make that happen. But I really want to get a column here to show when you do different distinct actions like input wise in order to to play the challenge. So the last column is total inputs. So how many times you actually have to press a button or hold a button or whatever for the entire game. And as you can see on the low end, you have a minimum of eight. So there's a game called uh, Sneaky Spirits. I'll show you. Sneaky Spirits 1. And this game only has eight beats total, eight inputs, yet it's just really interesting. <laughs> So obviously there, this game gives you an opportunity to hit these ghosts on beat eight. Uh, by messing with the rhythms, it actually creates a lot of interesting sort of tension with anticipation and it's really fun. So this is one of the simplest examples of 
uh, the rhythm games in the entire game because you only hit the A button eight times. And I'm going to contrast that with the, one of the highest examples in the entire game. It's actually here, uh, Flock Step. And you hit the inputs 440 times. So eight being on the low end and 440 being on the high end is such an, a large contrasting range of numbers. Yet all these games feel complete and all of them test your skills in different ways. And that's just something really interesting to point out. I'll talk about that in a bit, but I want you to see this. So yeah, every time your your character steps, that's pressing on the button. And when you release, you want to release it in time so you keep the beat. Uh, so if you do that along with the birds, you are actually consciously uh, feeling out the timing of 440 different inputs uh, throughout this entire game. And it's actually a, quite a long one too. That's why it's, it gets up so high, but it still it varies up its timing pretty interestingly by the end. And the visuals are always nice. So yeah, that's the entire range of the the spreadsheet that I made and. You know, this is a ton of data, and this is a lot, this is a super refined way of looking at all the diversity of Rhythm Heaven and really understanding how it builds its levels. And I think, you know, there are a lot of different ways to analyze it, but some of the interesting conclusions I came to is that there's really no correlation between tempo and, you know, level design complexity, right? So you might think offhand, oh, in order to make a rhythm game or a timing challenge or an action game or whatever harder, uh, you increase the tempo. Well, this game does a lot with complexity. It does a lot with all these different columns right here. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the faster it is, the harder it is, right? One of the most complex challenges in the entire game, which is the final remix, the final level in the entire game, has a nine. And as you can see here at the bottom, all of this right here is filled in solid green. So that means this, this final challenge does acceleration, internal, external. It mixes on and off beats. It has call and response. You tap, you hold, you hit extra buttons, and the visuals are obscured. So it does everything. There's a lot to be said about how to create challenges. So there's a lot to be said uh, about if your game system even has varied axes in order to make very uh, different experiences for the player. And when you're talking about interactive experiences, I think it's really important to talk about skill-based experiences because using your skills in all these different ways is how you create different sort of controller fields, how you create different experiences inside your head, it's how you create different sort of interactive experiences. And these axes right here, these dark blue ones for Descartes and everything else is how Rhythm Heaven is able to take a really simple game where you're only inputting on average uh, two things per mini game, like you hit the button or you hit another button. You only have one button, but you maybe are looking out for two things. That's why most of this column right here in the yellow is light uh, yellow because you really aren't doing that much per mini game. Yet, each individual mini game, as you can see here, has a ton of diversity. This checkerboard pattern for all these stats in green and red means that it's just a scattering of different attributes, right? So, you know, even though you tap a lot for the games, you may not have a lot of external timing. You may accelerate in one and not for the others. 32%, 11, 61, 58. It just mixes up everything and creates a whole bunch of different challenges for you to enjoy. And I think that's something really interesting to think about. So as we can see here, we're back on the design oriented wheel. And if we go to gameplay elements right here and we hover over to dynamics, which are the rules that link, connect or affect multiple game elements simultaneously, we can go over to game time, which is how game is how game time is defined relative to real life time. And we can hover over this one right here. Beep. Real time, which is the continuous time where the game state updates at a constant rate compared to real life time, commonly done 30 to 60 times per second for video games. And real time is a really big deal because I think Rhythm Heaven is a game that focuses almost entirely on timing challenges, really. You don't move your character around at all. Um, you don't have, you know, RPG stats or, or places to explore or things to do. All you, all you are is stuck in this 
static view, right? You can't move or change uh, which mini game you play, and you're you're stuck on this linear progression. But entirely by changing up how the tempo is, how the timing challenges are given, what kind of timing challenges are given, how you interact with it, and how they mess with your feedback, they're able to create what is essentially three and a half hours of solid, like solid varied video game content and as we can see by the chart as we can see by all the data we've taken as we can tell just by like looking at the video game the content is varied both in terms of visual elements characters uh timing challenges sound effects tempo musical style there's some jazz there's some sort of robot like factory style music there's <laughs> So you might be tempted to think, oh, it's a music rhythm game. Just change the music that goes behind it, and that pretty much takes care of what's going on. But that's really not the case. You can have a lot of different style of music. You can have a lot of varied tempo. But the thing that really gets the gameplay to be diverse is really what catches your attention, which creates all these distinct gameplay moments, which creates a stronger connection to the diversity of the music in the first place, is all these various axes. And this is going to be the foundation of what we're going to uh, use to analyze just about every action game that we come across from now into the future. So that's mainly what I want to say about Rhythm Heaven Mega Mix's diversity. I wanted to show you the categories. I wanted to give you a few examples so you can see it for yourself. And I wanted to say that, hey, uh, gameplay is really complex. Even though this game looks really, really simple, it actually does things that are more complex than I've seen out of any other rhythm action game. So sure, Guitar Hero, you play a lot of notes and that music is real music. So we obviously have a certain kind of appreciation for that. But what Rhythm Heaven does is it builds the simplest game possible and by looking at as few inputs as possible and as few visual cues as possible uh, it says where is the core of the gameplay challenge if everything is about timing then let's make everything about timing let's not have the player distracted by other inputs let's not have the player distracted by other systems and how far can we take this and apparently it takes it really far because that's quite a lot of content in this game and it's quite a lot of diversity as we've just seen so this is going to set the foundation for how we understand just about every other timing challenge uh, for video games. We're going to look at it and say, okay, uh, how little do you need in order to create a wide range of varied challenges? And from there, that's when we can consider, well, what's getting in the way of this? How much of this is excessive? How much of the complexities in the system don't actually create more varied timing challenges? Because there's a lot of stuff you can add into a video game, but it may not all necessarily add to what's core and what's interesting and what's good about its gameplay. So I'm going to leave off right here. There's going to be a lot more we're going to do. We're going to reference back to this chart for future episodes. I'm going to actually build sort of a, well, I'm not going to actually reveal it right now. You're going to have to wait and see what, what's going to happen on that. But I just wanted to share this with you because this is one of my favorite games. So this has been our episode of Design Over Time. I'm Kirby Kid. You can follow me at Kirby Kid on Twitter. Or you should subscribe to us down on YouTube right there. And leave us a like if you like this video. Because, you know, it took me six hours to make this chart. And this video is only about uh, 10, 15 minutes. So... 10, 15, I probably should say 15 to 20 minutes. So I really appreciate your feedback. And if you would share with someone else who you think likes music rhythm games or is really interested in understanding the core foundation, the core fundamental aspects of what makes action games tick. So we will come back with another episode tomorrow. And until then, I will see you guys next time. Peace.